If you ever, maybe I should say it this way, it's easy sometimes for us to lose our focus, isn't it? What I mean by that is we, we began with a, a certain goal in mind, a certain desired outcome or purpose for our actions, and somewhere along the line, we get distracted. We've seen this happen, if you're a fan of sports, you've seen those times when a coach will call a timeout, and that coach, either whether it's male or female, will call the players over, and they'll take and use that timeout to refocus their team, to get them back on track of what they're trying to accomplish in the game, because they've lost that focus. Maybe in your work environment, you've been part of a project at work and your project manager has called you together, called the, the group together in a special meeting in order to reorient you to your goal. Here is what we're trying to achieve with this project. Here is our goal. Here's what we need to do to make sure that this happens this way. Maybe those of you who are married at one time or other have gone to a marriage counselor. Nothing wrong with doing that. Or maybe you've taken a vacation and the purpose of that vacation is simply to refocus your energies in your marriage. To stop and think about why, why are we married in the first place? What is our goal? What are we trying to do for each other? How is it that we can be better for one another? I believe that Jesus did this with his disciples on more than one occasion when you read through the Gospels. One particular one is found over in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus takes his disciples to an, a region that's actually outside of what would typically be Judean territory, a place known as Caesarea Philippi. It is the, near the headwaters of what is typically referred to as the Jordan River. And there he asked his disciples two questions to reorient them, if you will, or to help them develop their focus. First one is found in verse 13, and it is this, it is, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Two verses later in verse 15, he says, he asks them specifically, who do you say that I am? And the purpose of these questions was to focus his disciples' attention upon, first of all, who he really is, and then secondly, upon his purpose for being here in this world. I think that Paul did the same thing in our text that we're looking at today, actually in chapter 2. Because one of the things that we find him addressing on, in two different verses, in the first 12 verses here in chapter 2, has to do with what he calls the gospel of God. If you look, first of all, in verse 2, here's what he says, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst, amidst much opposition. What's his focus? It's the gospel of God. You drop down to verse 9, the very first verse that Mitch read for us just a moment ago, and he addresses that same topic again topic again because there he says you recall brethren our labor and hardship how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you we proclaim to you the gospel of God apparently as you read through these first two chapters of Thessalonians Paul's first letter to them you find that there were those who were trying to distract the new Christians from their faith by making accusations against Paul and Silas and Timothy and the way in which they proclaimed their message while they were there. They were spreading false rumors. They were saying things like, Paul is preaching an erroneous message, a message that is deceitful. Or maybe, as we find, they were saying of Paul that he was simply preaching to, to please others, to flatter other people. Or, Paul's preaching simply out of a, greed, a motivation of greed. He's just doing it for the money. And each time Paul comes back, addresses the charge, and focuses again upon what I'm really doing. I'm proclaiming the gospel. I'm sharing the message of God. It is the gospel of God. 
And the last thing that Paul wanted was for anything to get in the way of the effectiveness of the message. Now think about that for just a moment. The last thing that Paul wanted was for anything to get in the way of the effectiveness of that gospel message. This morning as we focus upon what Mitch read for us just a moment ago, verses 9 through 12, he carries that idea on. He looks at some things, and I would like for us to examine what he writes and what he says about the way that he and Silas and Timothy conducted themselves or behaved among the believers and ask ourselves, each of us, an important question. When I look at the character traits, when I look at the things that Paul says about the way he behaved and Silas behaved and Timothy behaved, am I behaving the same way? Because the last thing that any of us here want to do is get in the way of the message. We want the message of God, the message of God's salvation through Jesus Christ, the gospel, to have free recourse in our community and in our lives to make the difference that it is able to make because the power of God is behind that message. So let's look at what Paul says about the way they behaved among those believers there in Thessalonica. And we'll start with this question. It is what he addresses, first of all, there in verse 10, and ask ourselves, is our behavior toward our brothers and sisters in Christ a behavior that, as Paul would say here in verse 10, is devout? He talks about how devoutly, and as he says in verse 10, uprightly and blameless, we behaved among you. So think about that. The behavior of Paul and Timothy And Silas, toward the Christians in Thessalonica, was devout. It demonstrated the utmost moral purity. The way they conducted themselves was in keeping with the practice that Peter specified to the saints that had been scattered throughout Asia Minor in his first letter. If you go over to 1 Peter chapter 1, and you look there in verses 15 and 16, what Peter says there is this, Like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. For it is written, you shall be holy because I am holy. You see, God calls us as His people to holy behavior. And that holy behavior is to be a distinctive within the body of Christ. So the question for us this morning is this. When we look out in our church family are there others in our church family that can look at us and say I can tell by being around you that you act out of a devotion to God your devotion your love for him is such that you want to live a life that is holy in his presence and it stands out I see it in you every day that I'm around you it is one of the best compliments that another brother or sister in Christ here could give to you Do we conduct ourselves in a way that seeks to honor and be like our Heavenly Father? But then he says not only did they behave themselves devoutly, he says they also behaved themselves uprightly. It was righteous behavior. It was just behavior. It measured up to what God expects and requires of His servants. The way that we behave is a way that is right and just and fair. Have you ever noticed, children pick up on this very quickly. They'll accuse somebody of, that's not fair. Or, mom, dad, that's not right. They'll throw that one up in a heartbeat to you because they have a sense of fairness, a sense of fair play and what's right and what should be done. We don't lose that sense of fairness as we get older. At least I don't think we do. Maybe we're a little more quiet about suddenly saying, well, that's not right. That's not fair. But we still recognize it, do we not? We still recognize when we think something is not being done the way it should be done or when somebody is not acting in the way they should act. And Paul says we behaved in a way that was right. We behaved rightly among you. 
So the question for us is, for each of us, is can our brothers and sisters in Christ say that we have never treated them in a way that is unjust or unfair? Because Paul says, that's the way we behaved. We behaved rightly among you. And then there's that third thing he says. We behaved, as he points out, devoutly, rightly, and finally, blamelessly. Is our behavior here amongst one another blameless? Their conduct was, as another translation might say, irreproachable. What it means by that is it was able to stand up to the scrutiny of the critics. What are you accusing me of? There is no basis for it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says there that the reason that God chose us in Christ is so that, and he did so before the foundation of the world, Paul says, is so that we would be holy, and notice this, and blameless before him, that is, before Christ. If you go to another passage that Paul writes, Philippians chapter 2, there he talks about us working out our own salvation, and then if you, you drop down to verses 14 and 15, just a couple of verses later from that, he says there that, one of the ways that we prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent, he uses those two words together, is by doing everything without grumbling or disputing. How do we be blameless? We live as people who don't go around grumbling and complaining and griping about what goes on within the body of Christ. We rise above that. And then he also ties in with that in that same passage that we are people who, as he says in verse 16, we shine as lights in the world. How do we do that? It actually says that in verse 15. He says we do that as we hold fast to the word of God. So the way we work to be blameless is we hold fast to God's word, which allows us to shine as lights in the middle of a, in the midst of what he calls a crooked and perverse generation. And in the process of doing that, we aren't people who go around grumbling and complaining. Are we perfect? No. Do we sin? Yes. But being blameless means that we confess that sin before God. Father, I know I haven't lived the way you want me to live. I know I haven't been the person you want me to be, and I, I beg your forgiveness. It means that we apologize to our brothers and our sisters in Christ when we have not lived that way, and we acknowledge our, our, our shortcomings, and we say, I, I need you to forgive. But there's a second set of things that he adds in all of this. He talks about the way they, he treated them, and he says that he exhorted or they, I should say, exhorted and encouraged or comforted and implored the Christians there in Thessalonica, even as a father does his children. Break those down. First of all, he says that we exhorted you. That word exhort comes from, at least the word that Paul used, means to call somebody alongside of you in its basic understanding. And when you look at some other places that that word is used, it's interesting what's being said. If you go to Acts chapter 2, there in verse 40, Peter is preaching that first sermon on the day of Pentecost. And there, Luke, as he records those things, says that he kept, that is Peter, kept on exhorting them. Well, who's he, who is he exhorting? He's exhorting those Jews that had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost and were listening to this sermon and Peter kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved or save yourselves from this perverse or this untoward generation. He was exhorting. He was calling them, Leave that generation. Don't be like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul is addressing something that has been sent to him, apparently in a letter about some of the behavior of the Christians or what's going on in the church there in Corinth. And there in verse 10, he says this. He said, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind, having the same judgment. Four chapters later in this same letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, there in verse 16, or verse 6, he would say, Therefore, 
be imitators of me. Exhorting over and over again. My picture of this is the coach with the player on the team who knows that the player is not playing at his or her potential. And the coach gets in there with that player and says, I know you've got more in you. I know you can do better. I know you can work a little bit harder. And I'm calling you to do that. I'm challenging you. Give a little bit more of yourself. Paul says, that's what we did. We exhorted you. We called you to be more. And, and all of us at times need that in our lives. The question is, are, are we doing it for one another? Do we exhort one another by calling one another to God's standard of living on a daily basis? He says, we encouraged. Most of our translations, that's the word that the New American Standard used, but most of your translations use the word comfort. And you know when you read, if you go back to Acts chapter 17 and you read the brief account there of Paul's initial ministry there in Thessalonica, one of the things you readily see is that he had initial success, tremendous initial success, but then suddenly the rage of the Jews caused them to begin attacking him to the point that Paul had to be smuggled out of Thessalonica for his own safety. Paul was the one who was in need of comfort, if anybody needed comfort at that point in time. And yet, here is the man who is encouraging, speaking of encouraging and comforting the Thessalonians. He was reaching out to them. Folks, I think every one of us, at one time or another, have needed some cheering up, have we not? Needed somebody just to speak a good word of encouragement, of comfort to us. At other times, we have needed someone to come and comfort us or to console us because of a difficult thing that we're going through. In John chapter 11, in verse 31 of that chapter, John records for us Jesus' encounter with the sisters of Lazarus. Specifically, a statement is made by John about Mary. He says there in verse 31 that the Jews who were with Mary or were with Mary in the house and he tells us what they were doing they were consoling her why she just lost her brother they were consoling her in first Thessalonians this letter that we're presently working our way through in chapter 5 verse 14 one of the things that Paul instructs the Thessalonians there to do if you'll notice there he says comfort the faint-hearted. One translation says comfort the discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? Has it been meant a great deal to you for somebody to come to you and just comfort you, to lift you up, to help you along the way? Yes. It has. How good are we at cheering one another up? at comforting one another when the need arises. Folks, we need each other to help us through those difficult times in our lives. And, and I learned this probably more from a, a, a statement that I heard in a seminar years ago. Becky and I in Nashville uh, went to a seminar of different speakers or different individuals and one of the speakers that day was a man that you may recognize the name, Rudy Giuliani. He had been the mayor of New York City during the time of 9-11 when the terrorists hit the two, of the world, two World Trade Center towers with airplanes and caused them to crumble and, and many died. He made a statement that day that I've, it stuck with me. He said, during my time in office, he said, I made weddings of those that I had encountered during my time in office when I could. I instructed my staff, weddings, yes, if I can, but he said, do not let me miss a funeral. He said, I always did my best to make sure I never missed a funeral. He said, the reason 
He said, people won't remember if you've been to their wedding, but they will remember if you've been to the funeral of somebody they care about. During their times of grief and depression and struggle, people remember if you've been there by their side, if you've been there to help them out. That's what Paul says we did. That's what we are called to do. And then the last one that he says, he, and he talks about how we implored you. There are several words that are used here in different translations, depending on the one you're reading from this morning, to translate this one word that Paul uses. The New American Standard uses the word employ or implore. Sometimes you may see, if you were watching the screen this morning, the New King James uses the word charge. Other translations use the word urge or insist or plead. You kind of get the idea. This word has a great amount to it. And Paul knew that there were those in Thessalonica who without Christ were lost. And he pleaded with them in view of their situation, calling them, encouraging them, imploring them to do what was best, which was to turn to Christ. He knew what was right. And he worked to lead them toward that which was right, even though there were those around them who were trying to confuse them and to bring such confliction against them that they might just give up and not even try. And eventually, as we said at the beginning of this lesson, lose their focus. There are times when our Lord will use us to reach out to someone else, to implore them, to plead with them, to urge them to do what is best, what is right, what is true, what is God's will. The question is, are we people who will see the need that God puts before us and respond to that need when somebody in our own number is in those, that situation? And do we do these things and, and, and I've looked at this. If you remember back in verse 8, two weeks ago, he talked about how they, he cared for the, the Christians at Thessalonica as a nursing mother cares for her children. Here he comes back and talks about we did these things as a father does or would do his own children. And I've thought about that. What is Paul saying? When we exhort... When we encourage, we comfort. You don't typically think about a father comforting children. But here he speaks about as a father does these things. When we plead with our children, do we not respond in a different way to our own children than we do to children that are not our own? Yes. Every father, every mother responds to their own children, whether we like it or not. Whether we, because... Of a reason. What is the reason? It's because they're our own flesh and blood. As, as we say sometimes in athletics, we've got some skin in the game when it comes to our own children. And it's because they can either lift our hearts up or they can break our hearts, can't they? Parents, you ever had your heart broken because of a choice your child made? Sure, if you've been parenting for very long at all, I'm sure it has happened to you. Have you ever felt like you're on top of, of, the, of the world because of a success you've seen your child have? Yes. Have you as a parent had the privilege of seeing your child obey the gospel and known the joy that you felt from that? Yes. And Paul says, I did all of these things as a father would for his children. And you see, that's what we're called to do. To respond in such a way that those that are on the receiving end of our behavior see that we have such a deep love for them and concern for them that we want what is best. Why is all this so important? Why is it important that we get it, if you will, today? It's because of what Paul goes on to say in the very last verse of all of this. It is because we want every brother and sister in Christ among us this morning to walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. God has called us. 
Why? Well, if you go all the way back to the beginning, when God created everything that we see around us, when he put the first man and woman upon this planet, in the beginning, God determined to create for himself a people who bear his character and his image, his nature, if you will. Satan, however, came along and threw a monkey wrench in all of that because what he did is he deceived the first couple and ended up corrupting that creation, which meant that God had to come back, and God knew he was going to do this, but God has since that time pursued us in order to bring us back to himself. Why? Because rightfully, we're his anyway. And ultimately... In order to do that, he gave that which was dearest to himself, his only son, in order to redeem us, to draw us back to him. So Paul says, we live lives that are worthy of the God who loved us enough to call us to himself, to send his son to die for us. The question is, are we living those kind of lives? Are we are we the presence of Christ in this community? Because that's what God is calling us to be, the presence of Christ in this community. But there's a second aspect to all of that as to why this is so important this morning, and it's what he adds to that at the end of verse 12. It is not only are we to live a life that is worthy of that calling, but it is that he has called us to his kingdom and his glory. Think about that. God has called you. He has invited you to his kingdom and his glory. There will be a day when the Son of God returns and he will say to those that are faithful, inherit the kingdom which my Father has prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit the kingdom. And along with that kingdom comes all the glory that God has in himself that we get to experience. I think that's why Paul would write there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And I've used it time and again. I've probably worn you out with it, but eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has the mind of man conceived all that God has prepared for those who love him. He's called you to his kingdom and his glory. Don't lose your focus. Don't get caught up in everything that Satan throws at you because he loves to confuse, he loves to conflict, he wants to do anything he can to deceive. Keep your focus. Remember, it's still about the gospel. We're still preaching just a pure message of a Savior who came and died so that we might have eternal life. We're still preaching a message about a God who loves us and cares for us and wants us to be with Him eternally. And this morning, if you're among us and you haven't, confess the name of Christ, you haven't turned away from your sin, repented of that sin and said, I don't want to live this way any longer and made the decision that today I want to live for, my, for God. I want to have my sin taken away. I want to be His for the rest of my life and throughout all eternity. Then make today that day. Don't leave this place this morning without making that decision. Everything is ready. Everything back here is ready. The water is ready. The garments are ready. All that is needed is you. So today, if you need to respond to our Lord's invitation to give your life in obedient faith, or if you're a child of God who's lost your way, lost your focus, and you need our prayers on your behalf, won't you come right now? As together we stand and sing.